Um, I just don't think it matters, to be honest with you. And that's was something that I've been struggling with the last three years. I've had some conversations with clo close colleagues. But, you know, I, I got into it because I really love the weight room and I love some of those, those physical components. But now I'm just thinking about no matter what I get my athletes in the weight room, I, I just don't know if it really moves the needle forward in terms of them being better players on the court, on the field, on the pitch. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one resource for all things fitness and performance in Switzerland. Today, we'll be chatting, chatting with Michael Zwiefel, who is the owner of Building Better Athletes, a performance gym located in Dubuque, Iowa. Hey, Michael, thanks for coming on the show, man. Thanks for having me, Sean. Look, looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, so after this short and sweet little intro, can you give us a little bit more about you, who you are, and what you do? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I'll just start here and work backwards, I guess. But I, yeah, I currently own a uh, building better athletes um, like you said here in, here in Dubuque Iowa we work with, with a wide range of athletes so in a given day we'll see every make and model of athlete you can think of from you know an eight-year-old to a six-year-old and everything in between um, so we work with every different sport um, the main sports that we're probably working with would be like American football uh, baseball basketball track and field those would probably be our primary uh, athletes that the sports that we work with um, you know, we work in small groups. So we have, you know, basically like an elementary school type group, a middle school type group, a high school group, a college group, <clears throat> and then an adult group um, with some, some, you know, some mixtures in between there. So again, working with a wide range of athletes, primarily I'd say the majority of our athletes are that high school age or, and, and younger. So kind of that adolescence, that youth, um, novice type of athlete in that regard. Um, but yeah, we're doing this now for, I think it's been about almost a decade now, about eight years uh, owning building better athletes and, and kind of growing and working um, in the in the private sector during this time, I've also actually been on and off with the, with the college teams. I, I've been a, a strength coach um, in a local university, their NAIA, which isn't NCAA, and so I work more as a consultant with them, um, doing that for eight years. And then for actually a five year stretch, I was a, a uh, an assistant strength conditioning coach at a local university as well. So been in both the private and public sectors. Um, played American football in college and professionally. I um, actually played overseas in, in Vienna, Vienna, Austria, um, for the Vikings um, after I, the Packers released me. I was with the Green Bay Packers for a short time. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of the, the brief history there. Yeah, so from transitioning from you as an athlete, how did you get into coaching? Was that a natural transition? How did it happen? Yeah, I think I've always – I always knew I was going to get into coaching. My, my dad's a, a, a football – American football coach. He's been coaching for – Oh, heck, 40 years. Um, so, you know, I, always, I grew up in a football locker room. Um, I, I always knew I wanted to coach. Um, just what capacity, and I'm still kind of actually tackling that question, uh, you know, how I want to move forward with this, but I always want to be involved with coaching in some, some capacity. But I, um, my summer jobs during high school, summer jobs during college was, was coaching, you know, local camps, uh, whether it be football, basketball, back with the high school, or just like back in college when I kind of started this – training athletes because I, I, I always loved the process of working to get better and I always enjoyed um, the, the details and the nuance of all the different components how they how can they infect and influence uh, performance and so all my summer jobs are always you know coming back coaching camps or just running you know one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions with certain athletes in the area that knew who I was and wanted to train with me so um, just something that I always knew I wanted to get into I was very fortunate um, coming up um, not only have my father as a coach in, in my household, but had a really great high school track coach and basketball coach that um, were really great mentors to me. And so I was really fortunate to have really good coaches as I was coming up and, you know, wanted to give back um, to some of the athletes, you know, hopefully in some capacity that I was able to, uh, to have when I was coming up. So, um, you know, I was going to be a coach. And so uh, it's been it's been a great, a great experience uh, being on the other side of the uh, spectrum from an athlete now to being a coach. So you talked about the different components and the nuances. Can you tell us a little bit about your, from your point of view, from your, your philosophy of coaching, what are the pillars of physical preparation for sports? How do you break it down in your own mind? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say I necessarily have any pillars that I've kind of laid out. I'm definitely you know, when I listen to podcasts or talk to the coaches, I mean, they seem to be a heck of a lot more organized probably than I do. Um, like laying out things in, in a certain plan. I definitely don't think that way. And I probably don't coach that way either. Um, but I can tell you this, you know, being this now for close to a decade, like I, 
honestly, I, I don't, you know, I, was, I probably viewed it as a strength conditioning coach, um, but I don't necessarily, you know, put a lot of eggs in that strength, that strength in the weight room type of a basket with my athletes. Um, I just don't think it matters, to be honest with you. And that's something I've been struggling with the last three years. I've had some conversations with close, close colleagues, but, you know, I, I got into it because I really love the weight room and I love some of those, those physical components. But now I'm just thinking about no matter what I get my athletes in the weight room, I, I just don't know if it really moves the needle forward in terms of them being better players on the court, on the field, on the pitch. Um, I'm honestly got to the point now where – I'm hoping that, you know, my influence is a, we can probably talk about this later on, but like movement, I really think the on-field actual movement um, training is, is where you, me as a preparation coach makes the biggest impact. And then, you know, probably even more so than that would be if I can somehow influence and change behavior or, um, you know, the other 23 hours of the day that the athletes aren't with me. Um, so, if, you know, hoping to make some sort of habitual habits or behavior changes in their nutrition, their sleep, I think that probably outweighs anything that I could ever program in the hour that I'm in the gym uh, with me. Um, so that's where I've gone. And, you know, probably really started back in high school when I really, you know, wanted to maximize who I was in that, as an athlete. It definitely, when I saw the biggest improvements and jumps was when I really took care of, and I understood the importance of what I put in my body is vitally important. So my nutrition, my supplementation, how I took care of my body in terms of sleep, in terms of uh, taking care of soft tissue, in terms of recovery and rest. Um, those were probably the areas, the categories that, again, not many kids my age at that time, 15, 16 year olds were, were taking, were probably even considering those things. And that's where I took a jump being a really good athlete to being, you know, really well known in the area in the state for my performances, because I really, I, I, I knew that that was my advantage. And that was for me mentally. And I know this is a very, common mindset in athletes like I'm going to train harder than anybody else I'm going to spend more time on the field or more time getting up shots or whatever sport it is I'm going to spend more time practicing it well I, you know what I try to tell my athletes is that hey that's a good mindset to have obviously but we all know that we only have certain amount of capacity for to perform work because otherwise we, we break down we get injuries you know, but when I tell my athletes in that what I what my mindset was that I'm going to find that advantage I'm going to do more than anybody else nutritionally no one's going to eat as as good as well as i'm going to eat no one's going to sleep and have their bedroom environment their sleep environment you know to the quality that i'm going to have it no one's going to take care of their bodies like i'm going to have it so you know i try to stress my athletes there's way there's much more ways to have that competitive advantage than just spending more time in the batting cage or more time getting up five thousand shots a day wherever it may be you can have that competitive advantage by your breakfast by your lunch by your dinner you can have that competitive advantage by what you do that half an hour before bed. So there's a lot of different ways that I think I, my, what I see myself is I want to affect that. If I can somehow, you know, influence and affect behavior and, and ha habitual change in terms of maybe their habits before bedtime, maybe it's their breakfast, whatever it may be. Those are all areas that I don't think many athletes, especially young athletes think about that. That component could be just as beneficial, even more so than spending an extra half an hour practicing your sport. And so I, I try to make that very clear. Um, again, I don't have certain um, silos or, or areas or uh, categories that I try to lay out with my athletes, but I just want to affect that other 23 hours. And I think that's where, as coaches, I think we probably have more influence and impact than the hour they, that, that they are with us. I think those other 23 hours are much more beneficial. So I'm trying to really work on the last couple of years of how I can touch and influence those other 23 hours that they're not with me. Yeah, I like that idea of the, the other 23 hours. What are you doing then to, to, make, to make the difference? So I want to come back to this later on. I do want to come back on, on the piece of, uh, of the strength. Um, you know, let's take, for example, a, a football player that you might be working with who's, say, in college. Um, so how strong is strong enough? Because you, you need to have a certain baseline just, you know, for, for structural purposes, uh, injury prevention. You want some muscle mass, say, around the shoulders and other areas because they're going to take some hits. So how do you decide, okay, now he's strong enough, we're going to maintain this, and now we can really kind of focus in on, on the speed and the agility on the perception on the reaction and all those other factors that, like you said, have a much bigger impact on the field than how much you bench? Yeah, and I, I don't have a number for how strong is strong enough. Again, what, what, what I think we all coaches need to realize that strength is, is expressed in many different forms and fashions. And just because someone has weight room strength or whatever exercise you want to pick in, in a weight room setting, does not mean that that strength is exhibited um, in the sport. And so 
strength is contextual. And that's what, you know, all the literature is showing nowadays is that, you know, just because you, you know, have a two times body weight uh, squat does not mean that that, some, that force will then be generated when you change direction or when you sprint. And so I don't have a specific number of strength, you know, how strong is strong enough. My goal in the weight room, kind of like you touched upon, Sean, would be to influence um, different structural components, to, to influence um, kind of robustness and resiliency of, like you said, certain uh, muscle groups or tissue parts uh, that the athletes will probably be exposed to in their sport. Um, but so for me, I don't, I never, in, in uh, all my athletes, I really don't, I know, I don't track weight room numbers. I'm not concerned with how much they lift. It's much more of the weight room is used as a tool to build some of this res tissue resiliency um, and robustness for certain body parts that will be exposed during sport. Um, so I do that much more, I say much, you know, more in terms of manipulating tempo, manipulating stance and variation, um, much more than I do it in, a, in terms of like adding more volume or adding more load. And so that's what, how my weight room is, is based upon. Again, I don't have a number how strong is strong enough. I've been in, the, in this long enough to know that I've had some really, really weak athletes in collision impact sports that are very successful and don't get injured. Yet you've had, I've had really, really strong athletes that go into a sport and I think, oh, they're really, really strong and they've gotten injured. So I, I don't think there is a certainly, there's not a number that how strong is strong enough. Um, but I see the weight room as a complementary tool to assist the skill development, to assist the, the practice, to assist the movement and the speed work rather than the other way around, which most strength conditioning co coaches see it, is that the weight room is the primary primary stimulus. It's the primary uh, area that we're going to spend time in. And then the speed, the agility, the skill work is going to be kind of secondary. And I just kind of flip those roles. So in that sense, I see the weight room much more as a, an assistive tool, a complementary tool to a, um, be able to provide a little bit more um, stress to certain, like, you, like we talked, I said earlier, certain body parts, muscle groups, to provide just a little bit more um, resiliency that they can then hopefully carry that onto their sport. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I got that problem, but I'm kind of forced that way in the sense that I don't have a weight room for the rugby team to operate in. And so I have time on the field and I could bring out a few dumbbells and stuff, but I find that my spent, my time is going to be spent way better doing, doing sprints, doing change of direction, doing, doing grappling and wrestling stuff than, you know, maybe adding 10 kilos to their squat, which maybe at their level could help a little bit. Uh, and obviously I do recommend that they do that on the side, but for me, it's, it's definitely not a, a, the main, the main thing that we work on throughout the, 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 the preseason at least. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, and even going up that like for my, my gym, I've actually kind of cut back on a lot of the equipment that I actually have to, to a emphasize space, but B again, when people think about getting stronger, again, we, we tend to think about that the barbell is the only methods or means for one to get stronger. And that's, you know, totally untrue. And, and so there's so many different means and methods that one can get strong um, that doesn't involve a barbell that I think coaches tend to, to forget about. And just like you said, we're, I work with some teams as well where we're out in a court or a field and we don't have the weight room there, but you can do manual resistance. You can do certain pushing and pulling against an opponent that I think that strength adaptation that you're going to get from those situations will be much more uh, transferred much more highly than, than say just, you know, a bench press or a squat to, to their sport. Is there value in those tools? Absolutely. But I just think we tend to think that the barbell is the only means and methods that one can get stronger. And it's not, it's, it's a great tool. Don't get me wrong, but I think it's oftentimes overused uh, when there's could be other methods and means that athletes or coaches could, uh, uh, you know, apply to their athletes, I think would get much more specific and much more transferable results that, than just st strictly a barbell. Yeah, so transitioning into this, I want to talk with you about agility and, and how, you, how you frame it and how you program it uh, or how you coach it, let's say. Uh, so to begin with, what are the biggest mistakes that you see in, in sports prep uh, regarding agility training? What are people doing that they think they might be affecting change, but maybe they might not be, or not to the extent that, that they think. Could you, can you kind of give your perspective on that? Yeah. Yeah. That, and this could be a long answer. Um, <laughs> the, you know, because there's so many different ways to take it. I'll, I'll, I'll just start with a couple. A is first and foremost, to understand that um, agility is different than change direction. That, that'd be probably the starting point. I think we're still in, in a time where not many people are not, I will say, I shouldn't say not many, but, there's still a large amount of people that don't realize or understand that agility 
is different than change direction. And agility, in order for something to be agility, there has to be some sort of perceptual component in order for it to actually qualify as agility. And mm -hmm. for me, you know, I'm working actually on a, a paper here to, to kind of lay out maybe a, an updated definition of agility. And what it, I understand is that agility is context specific, meaning the information that one encounters during the sport, the perceptual information, the spatial information, the speed information, that is what kind of directs and influences movement behavior. And so if you, when you don't have those components present, you're not actually training agility. And just as you know, an, an offense alignment could be very, very agile or in, uh, in, uh, have uh, high amounts of agility in their specific context. But if we remove them from that context and say put them in a basketball court, they may not have that agility because the context, the environment is what actually drives the movement behavior. And so when you don't have that environment present, you're not actually influenced or affecting that movement behavior. So that'd be one, just understanding that agility, there is not one singular biomotor capacity or capability that equals agility. Um, you know, I've had professional football players, NFL football players that you put them in a basketball court and they look like a fish out of water. Well, if they have such great agility in football, and these are skilled position players, a cornerback and a receiver that are playing in the NFL in football, but you put them in a basketball court and they seem to lack or possess that agility. Well, that just shows you that agility is it's not this universal thing that just one possesses. And no matter the context, you have agility. And that's not how it works. Same as hand-eye coordination. People think that hand-eye coordination is this universal thing. Same thing, you could take a, you know, a professional baseball player, put them on a, on a golf course, and they would look terrible, right? Well, it's, it's still swinging an implement, trying to hit a ball. But all of a sudden, it's the context, the information, the environment is different. Therefore, the behavior and the movement is different. Um, so that'd be one, just understanding that agility is a lot more complex and, uh, than change of direction, which involves cones. And that would be the second point would be this. Most people, I think a lot of people are starting to realize that and understand that. But what they think is that uh, change of direction underpins agility performance, meaning one's ability to um, produce or have possess technique in like cone drills or uh, closed drills will then mean that they possess that technique um, in an open agility environment. And that is not the case. And so to think that, that you need to start um, or underpin complex movement with closed movement, I, I think is a mistake. And I think it's a waste of time because those, again, when the information is decoupled or that information is not present, or that perception is not present, that's driving the movement, that contextual movement in their sport, then I think for me, I think it's just a waste, just a waste of time. Um, so I know that might be a little good starting point, Sean, I, I, I would go further than that, but I just don't think, I think it's a waste of time for many people to just go to closed drills because they think that underpins technique. What I suggest to a lot of coaches is just take, take some of those same things that you're probably doing in your, your closed drills, your change direct, direction drills, and just try to find ways to add a specific perceptual information within that and you're set. Um, so for, for me, that might be just putting another human body in front of them that they're moving off of. Um, that may not, most sports, um, minus like, you know, like swimming, diving and things like that, most field-based sports, the information that's very present in all those sports is another human body. I'm reading, I'm reacting, I'm perceiving another in, uh, human body. That's the information I'm deriving. That's, that's directing my movement. So if we can have a human body whenever possible, um, in our in our, our our activities or our drills, I think that is a heaps and bounds better than just laying down cones or laying down mini hurdles or just doing lines or whatever it may be. So, you know, for a lot of people that they start with like basic shuffling mechanics or basically basic crossover mechanics, or they'll get into and do like a 90 degree cut. Well, why can't we do all those things? But instead of laying down a cone and saying you're going to make your cut at this cone or a line, you're going to make your cut at this line. Why can't we just have a human being in front of them? that they are perceiving and then moving off of. So when the athlete in front of you makes their move, you, you couple your movement to them. And that, that, in that situation, it's very, it's just a small tweak, but now the athlete is actually getting uh, repetitions of a tuning or being sensitive to the information that they have to react to in sport. <clears throat> and that's another human body for most people. Now that, again, that, that may be watered down a little bit, I, you know, moving on beyond that and another, problem I see in the world of agility is that most people stick to simple uh, mirroring activities 
a mirror, like I said, that kind of what I laid out was like a basic mirror activity. And those things are great. Like a tag is great. Cat and mouse activities. Those things are great starting points. But like that's where me now, my warm-ups are basically those basic really um, mirroring cat and mouse tag type environments. But then when we actually get to the meat and potatoes of our movement, the information and the, the complexity and the constraints that I lay out are very specific to the sport and the behavior that I want my athletes to interact with. What I've seen now is this, is that while I think coaches are getting a little bit more aware of what our constraints are, and what agility is of, of perception and action coupling, what they're sticking to is mostly mirroring activities or tag activities that when you look at the behavior, you look at how it, it acts, how it feels, it doesn't act and feel or behave much like sport, right? They're fun games and they're, they're a good job of, of working on perception, but we need to get a little bit, move the needle a little bit more forward towards actual specific scenarios snippets or like bite-sized uh you know pieces of the actual game and have those be the majority of the meat and potatoes of our agility work not mirror activities not cat and mouse not tag those to me now are like baseline stage one that's where we start with we i really don't go uh, i don't work down any less than that that's like stage one and then we move on it's a very specific it's very um uh, trying to again take snippets and pieces of a game and how can we manipulate certain constraints to influence or manipulate behavior of our athletes? So again, I probably didn't answer quite maybe how you want it, but we can definitely go in deeper than this because this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. Yeah, when you were talking about the, the difference between change of direction and agility, it, it is, uh, I mean, evident in the sense that you have a closed versus an open environment. Um, but to play devil's advocate maybe for a second, um, when you talk about linear speed, you would still teach linear speed mechanics uh, without necessarily that open environment, correct? Or would you, in that case as well, go straight to an open environment? Or would you first practice close? We're talking about novice people that don't know how to put a, a foot in front of the other. Would you still teach them those basic mechanics before you move on to an open, uh, to an open environment? So, yep. So two things with this. Uh, I'll, I'll start with, let's see if I can remember them. Um, one would be this, what I've done with linear is, and by closed um, and versus open, I have to get a little more specific in what you mean by that. But for me, and when I do linear stuff, it's, there's no, I don't do really any more like uh, drill base. So no wall drills, wall switches, sled marches. When we do linear stuff, in a sense, it's all open. Meaning when we're trying to uh, affect and influence uh, maybe technical, mechanical change, it isn't an open environment meaning that they are actually sprinting or accelerating. So it's not, we're going to do a wall drill, break down eight, you know, switches on a wall or sled march. Um, it is actually, get on the line, we're going to do what I call three-step burst. It might be like a one-step burst, one-step burst, just one step out. And then kind of, you know, uh, uh, just uh, slowing down and walking back. And then we'll affect change in that regard. So in, in a sense, it's open meaning it's, it's a full speed acceleration. And then we'll progress to maybe two steps, three steps, five steps, where it may be. So I'm not necessarily breaking it down into these, this, this kind of part, whole part, kind of what a lot of coaches do. I'm keeping the whole. Mm -hmm. And the second regard, regard with that would be is this, that sprinting um, in general is a little bit more of a, it's a more repeatable action than, than kind of agility or, or movement in a field-based sport where it's so complex and so varying based on the scenario that you can get away, I think, a little bit with a little bit more um, actually just sprinting and working on some of the technical changes in sprinting, while sport is so much more complex that I don't think there's any baseline mechanical technical positions or shapes or techniques that I want my athletes to work on because the sport is so complex. So that, that kind of makes sense there. But um, so going back to the sprinting, what we do, what I have changed actually um, in the last few years is that I will definitely... 100% reduce the amount of kind of pure speed work that we do. I will start with maybe some burst and maybe, a, you know, uh, some resisted runs or wherever the, the, the emphasis of the day is. But then as soon as possible, very quickly, we go into contextualized sprinting. They're holding the ball. They're getting chased. They're chasing somebody. So very, very quickly, I reduce that, say, that closed component, and we get into, some, uh, we get into con uh, contextual sprinting. I do that a lot sooner and a lot more often than, we, than I do, um, than I used to do. 
And so obviously fly tens is a huge thing in the world of strength conditioning now. You know, we do fly, we, I still do fly tens, but I do a much more of getting chased or chasing somebody when we work on a max velocity. So we, I want to work on max velocity. Why can't I just open up the space, open up the time, have someone chase or chasing somebody else, um, you know, decrease some of the, the amount of op component, uh, opponents in the space, in the environment, and that will influence and affect the speed one reaches. And so my speed work is definitely reduced in terms of the purely speed work, in terms of purely like a session is going to be dedicated towards strictly speed. I don't do that anymore. Like we're not going to do a strictly a 45 minute session, hour session. That's purely speed. It might be 15 minutes of some bursts with some film review, um, technical review. And then we're going to get into a actual environment, a contextualized environment um, to proceed to work on speed in that environment. Um, so that's how I've gone to it um, in that regard. And yeah, that makes sense. I guess now that you clarified on that, because like you said, the linear speed transfers to a lot of, of run uh, other different running patterns. And when, even if you do a cut or a crossover in, in between those, you're still sprinting. So that will, it's worth kind of spending some time on the skill in and of itself. But if you had to cut down agility into the cut, the crossover, the shuffle, the this, the that, you would end up with like 15 different things to work on individually before you can put them all back into an open environment. So I guess, yeah, your, your answer makes, makes total sense on that. Go, Getting into those, you know, the environments, because as coaches, we, we have to create the environment for the athlete to then solve their own problem. Um, what, what do you think about when you're creating those environments? Let's talk about agility uh, again. Um, what are the things that come to your mind in terms of constraint that you, constraints that you can put on the environment uh, to get the, 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 the outcome that you're looking for out of the athletes? Yes, so that's a great uh, question there, Sean. So well, let's start with this constraints. And again, I think when people hear agility, they think about just like mad chaos, like it's going to be super dangerous athletes just running around. Well, and that's where constraint manipulation comes into play. And so, you know, one way we can, you know, you know, kind of move the needle forward or, or back on like complexity and chaos is by manipulation of constraints. So one would be, you know, just the amount of people or opponents in the environment. Um, so you can go from 1v1 to 1v2, 2v1, et cetera. So you can manipulate that to get to increase or decrease the complexity of the task at hand for older athletes uh elite level athletes we're gonna i want to we might you know we want to kind of enhance the complexity because sport depending on the sport is is very complex um again just going back to baseline like 1v1 for me is like a very starting point um, that's like a warm-up is all 1v1 but post that i tend to i tend to add a little more complexity to what we're doing again I think a lot of coaches end with 1v1. They do closed drills and we're going to end with a mirror drill. We've now done agility. But if you think about sport, if you break down sport, um, 1v, strictly 1v1 scenarios don't happen all that often. There's usually going to be some sort of uh, a, a, a teammate within the picture that you can use to your advantage or disadvantage. You usually have some sort of trailing or another defender coming from a certain angle of space. So 1v1 snippets or scenarios happen very, very uh, infrequently in sports. And when they do happen, it's a brief moment that you have to expose it, and then it's gone. Because if you wait too long, then there's another uh, opponent or opponents coming with into the picture. And so, again, another problem I see, um, and I'll get to this one here, another constraint you can manipulate, excuse me, manipulate is time. So more time is usually going to equal more speed, more forces, more stress, less time is going to kind of reduce the complexity, less speed, less, you know, forces, all that kind of good stuff. But what I see is this, time is one constraint. I think coaches need to do a lot better job of manipulating because when we do some certain mirror drills or environments or activities, what, what we typically happens is that you give the offensive person unlimited time to all of a sudden they're duking around for 15 seconds. And not only are we out of like the bioenergetic kind of uh, energy system that we, that's specific to sport. So that's not only specific to what you're working on. Now what you're, you're actually kind of, I think, developing skills that are not specific to the sport. You can't just dance around. No, no, matter, no matter what sport it is, you can't just dance around for, you know, five, six, eight seconds on one opponent and think you're, you're doing yourself justice because there's going to be a trailing opponent that's going to knock the shit out of you. So same with rugby football. You can't do that. So coaches need to, I think we need to reduce the amount of time that we give athletes to make decisions. So time is another one. Space is another easy one to, to, to manipulate more or less space. Again, if you want less complexity, less speed, less risk, just reduce the space. Just close the, the workspace environment. 
Do you want more complexity, more speed, more forces, more stress? Open the space. And we can manipulate that depending on the time of year, depending on the day of the week in terms of where the next game is and what's, what adaptations we want our athletes. Those are ones. Uh, another easy one to manipulate would be rules. So if you're doing like small sided games, and we do this with our football players a lot, basketball players, et cetera, just manipulate the rules. And that could be, you know, uh, who, can, who can move in what direction? Can you pass the ball forward or back? Um, so like, for example, a small sided game, game that we do with our, uh, on our football field would be, we just did it the other day, would be uh, defense has to, so it's like a three on three game. So offense has three players, defense has three players. The defense has to send a blitzer. So they have to throw, they have to have one of the three defenders has to blitz. The quarterback, okay, cannot run. So they can't pass the line of scrimmage. So we just added those two rules. Defense has to send a blitzer. It can be anybody they want from any location on the field. And the quarterback can't run. So why we did those rules, A, the blitzer, what it works on is the quarterback, you know, before the blitz comes, has to find and see where the blitz was coming from. It allows the offense to have one-on-one matchups, meaning there's going to be only two defenders now versus two other offensive players because it's 3v3, quarterback, and two skill guys. So they have one-on-one matchups. Um, if the ball is out and they catch the ball in space, they, they, they now have a chance, more of a chance, to manipulate that space, to make a guy miss and make a big play happen. The quarterback, what he's doing is that the fact that he can't run is he has to work on scramble. So he can't just catch it and run to open space. He actually, he actually has to keep his eyes up downfield, see what his receivers are doing, keep the play alive. The offensive receivers have to work on now scramble rules, which is a thing in NFL like football. When a quarterback breaks pocket, all teams have scramble rules. I Meaning if you're deep, you come shallow. If you're shallow, you go deep. So now they're working on these scramble rules. So just by manipulating these easy rules, we, we uh, are influencing behavior in a manner that I wanted my athletes to work on. With the blitz coming, you have to get the ball out fast. So you have to get the ball out at different arm angles, depending where he's coming from. Um, you have to change, you have to move the throwing pocket or where you're going to set up your feet. Um, so those are all easy ways and rules. People often think about, forget about just it, uh, manipulating the rules can be very beneficial. The last main way that I do it is equipment. Manipulate the equipment, especially working with young athletes. This is a huge, huge area that coaches do it intuitively. They may not even know it, but you're manipulating the equipment, the size of the size of the ball, size of the bat, size of the, the goal, the height of the, the net, height of the rim, et cetera, um, are all easy ways to manipulate equipment. So like for young, our young athletes, and these are um, kind of diverse athletes, so we're not working on a singular sport. Like one of the things we work on is like volleying, so keeping something in the air. Instead of getting like a soccer ball out or a volleyball out or a rugby ball out, where it may be, and just work on keeping the ball up, we might bring out like a beach ball or, or a, a balloon that naturally the d- dynamics of those that equipment promotes the ball staying longer in the air. So they have more volleys, they have more success. So that's an easily easy uh, equipment manipulation to promote um, some of the skills and behaviors that we want our athletes to adapt. If you think about like tennis, what's a big thing in tennis is that they, they, they uh, lower the net. They have a ball that, you know, um, bounces higher. They have bigger rackets. All those are equipment manipulations that coaches have been doing for years. What's popular in, in soccer or, or uh, European football? Well, futsal is super popular, right? It's a heavier ball, a smaller ball. It stays on the ground longer to promote more foot contacts or contacts. Um, so all those skills and behaviors are uh, being adapted because of an equipment change. So those are the main ways that I uh, uh, manipulate constraints. That being said, going back to all the way to start would be when you manipulate constraints, especially if you're working with any kind of athletes that uh, play a certain sport or we have a team of athletes, those constraints should have very specific goals or outcomes. It's not just willy-nilly, we're going to just throw this in here because it looks fun or cool. No, like the, the, the purpose of constraint manipulation is to encourage the athletes to interact with new information and to promote, um, to promote creativity, to cr- cr- promote adaptability to these new constraints. So like I laid out in that football example, example I, I put those rule changes, those constraints in place for very specific reasons. It wasn't just because, you know, let's just do this on this day because I think it, I saw a coach on Instagram do it, so I'm going to copy it. No, the constraint manipulation should be for a really direct and specific reason for athletes to adapt new, more functional, more robust movement uh, problem-solving ability to these constraints, not just because it looks fun or looks cool. Um, So that's where, I guess, you know, working on agility, and manipulating constraints where I come from it. That's kind of the background I come from it, uh, at it from. 
So in, in those, from all those constraints that you, that you laid out for us, uh, is there like one that you're kind of really careful with that, you know, is, you know, kind of high stakes and you, you want to manage it really carefully versus the other ones, or are they two, are they all kind of on the same playing field? Yeah, it, it absolutely. It all depends on the, the context of the athlete, the hand, the, the age, the sport, et cetera. Um, that being said, probably the one I manipulate, uh, you know, first and foremost would be like time. So time, because time is the kind of the ultimate constraint for creativity. And so I definitely am always aware of time. I always have a time constraint with my athletes. So that would be number one. Um, number two would be like space. Um, those the time and space kind of go hand in hand. Um, so if you, if you think about it, if you manipulate space, a bigger space, you're probably gonna have more time, small space, less time. So those kind of go hand in hand. Um, is same thing. If you give an athlete less time, they, they're, they, can only explore a certain amount of space in that time. So those two kind of go hand in hand in that regard. Um, um, after that would be definitely the number of opponent, opponents. Um, so understand that moving on beyond 1v1, but the number of opponents in the, into an environment would be this, the second one. So those would probably be the one, two, and three areas that I, I work to manipulate. And then the last ones would probably be um, rule change and equipment change. Right, that's, that's really interesting. So I want to talk now about uh, teaching speed. And more specifically, teaching speed to youth athletes that don't have any experience, any previous experience, say, in track or anything like this. So how do you take young kids who are still maybe a little bit clumsy and can't put a foot in front of the other and teach them the mechanics of, of acceleration and sprinting? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question, a tough question. And I think if I had the answer, I'd be a, a rich man. You know, what, <laughs> what, how do you teach it? Again, for me, it's, it's, I don't break it down. Like I know whole part whole, whole and part whole is a, a very popular thing, but I want my athletes to actually, those young athletes to actually run fast and or, and or we'll just manipulate again, certain constraints within the environment, whether it be adding like wickets or Excel ladders or holding an implement, those di different constraints, let the body self organize around those constraints, but it's still the whole being there. So again, what we want to think about is not like breaking down a task, we don't want to do like task decomposition. We're just breaking down to its constituent parts and then trying to build it back up. We want to do a task simplification. So that might be just reducing the distance. It might be taking out body parts. So that's, that's why people use like a dowel or a hurdle on their back. It takes out the arms. The body now has to self-organize around that lack or that constraint. And so the lower body now has to self-organize around that constraint. That's why people do wickets. Those are self-organizing tools. Um, so again, I wouldn't say that all my young athletes have super great technique or mechanically sound, but when we do work on it, I want them to run fast and we're going to keep the whole, the whole, we're going to, we're going to just simplify the task, um, and maybe reduce the distance, but we're going to ha still have them run fast, um, in that regard. So I don't have a great answer to that, but other than simplifying the task for them, I still want them to run fast. Um, little kids don't like drills. They don't like repetitive, you know, get on a wall, do the do wall drills or things like that. Um, instead, what I want to do is just manipulate their body or the, the environment and its constraints and then let them self-organize around that. So the three favorite ways I kind of laid out two would be them holding some sort of implement, them going over like mini hurdles or just uh, little sticks on the ground or just doing like lightly resisted running. Again, that's a huge benefit of resisted running is the, the self-organization effects, the mechanical technical effects that a resistance, some sort of resistance around your waist has, it automatically, your body automatically organizes around that constraint because it is a constraint to get into more effective and efficient uh, movement strategies. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to move yourself. So that's how I would do it. Manipulate constraints, simplify the task, but still keep the whole, the whole, still keep the, the main goal, which is sprinting or accelerating. I still want that present. I don't want to break it down. Um, I want the whole, the whole. And so that's for you, youth athletes, for your slightly older athletes, <clears throat> let's say if you, if you had extra time, if you had all the time that you wanted, would you still dedicate some of that time to drills in one respect or another, or would you still just kind of put all your money into the box of keep the whole, the whole and, and, and just sprint? Yep. I, I put all the money into that, that whole, the whole, um, don't do really any, any, uh, mechanical or technical drills anymore. So, other than again, if you, you could, I guess you could count like resisted running as a mechanical or technical tool or a drill. That that's that'd be the, the gist of it. But other than that, um, no, 
again, our athletes, during our warmups, we may do some of our, um, again, working with a partner, perceptual type things, we may do some different, like, um, single switches, double switches during our warm-up, um, but they're oftentimes doing that off a partner. That'll be the, the, the extent of our drills, but I'm not, like, starting off with 15 minutes of uh, breaking down sprinting or acceleration into certain drills and then building it back up. I, I don't do that at all. Our athletes can tell you after we start basically every movement session with what I call, like I said later earlier, with like bursts. One, two, three, four step burst. So they're going right away to the hole. It might only be two steps, but it's still a full go, uh, two step acceleration. And then I'll um, give feedback or adjust um, their uh, constraints, whether it be me making them hold something or giving them uh, wickets out in front of them. Or also people think, you know, forget about that feedback and communication and cues is also a constraint on the body. Um, so then now they're working out with that kind of verbal constraint or feedback that they're trying to think about for the next repetition. So for me, no, no, no drills at all, no breaking it down. We're going right into the whole like two, three step burst. And we do that every day. And for me, it's a chance for them to calibrate. It's a chance for them to self-organize. It's a chance for me, uh, us, me as a coach and them and the athletes to have some feedback back and forth. I might film it and just play it and have them watch themselves. Um, so that's kind of the, the feedback. But no, uh, we don't do any kind of linear speed-based drills anymore, no. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. It's, it's something of, of moving slowly towards last year. I, pro, I programmed a lot of those just power speed drills, uh, especially at the end of the warm up and, and doing more kind of wall drills and stuff. Uh, this year, though, we're going to do we are going to do a few minutes of just, you know, running. And then we're going to go into our we're going to go into our, our acceleration and our speed work, because like you said, I mean, I don't I don't have a lot of time, so I got to make the most of it. And I think that that's where I mean, that's where the game is, is won or lost. It's not on is your you know can you bring your toe up with your knee when you're doing your uh when you're doing your march and all that kind of stuff so uh, i think that's an interesting approach um i've heard you talk about transitional speed can you can you talk a little bit more about uh what it is and how it applies specifically to field sport athletes yes yeah this, uh, let me get that i love what you said earlier and that's i just want to kind of backtrack just a second before i get to transitional speed on sure sure, sure. why i got to this approach um in terms of like cutting back all those drills is because that's I used to be very that way like seven eight six years ago I was definitely that way it was like a half an hour of, of drills of different wall variations of different sled march variations of different breaking down the task and this is what we're talking about linear speed here and what I saw was when we go when we went back to the hole my athletes never really kept um, or transferred or retained any of what we worked on all those drills that we worked on all the cues that I gave them all the things that when we actually had them sprints or had them race, or have them get chased, or have them time, all those things went out the window. I thought, what the hell am I spending a half an hour for on these drills if, if it's not really being retrained or transferred? What, why am I spending this time? And this was over years. Like, I'm not seeing these kids. They look great in these drills. Like you said, they could look great in an in a, in a A-skip or great in a wall drill. Then all of a sudden, we get them in a contextual environment where they're not thinking about that, and they, they, they're not retaining any of those things. So why am I wasting my time on those things? It's, it's almost... Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, no, LeBron, it's, it's, it's almost like the, on the macro level, we were talking before about s strength not uh, transferring to, to field performance, and now we're talking about the micro as well, you know, do those drills transfer to the task of, of sprinting in and of itself, and like you said, it's, it's not that clear, because once you tell them to go, you'll see something completely different than when they were doing those, the, the perfect drills in the beginning. Yeah. And I saw this in an acute manner, like in a single session, like, all right, they're picking up my wall drills, they're picking up this, this sled march, they're picking up these drills I'm, I'm laying out. And I think, all right, they're getting better because they are getting better because they're just getting better at the drill. But then when I took them back to an actual open environment, those weren't retained. So not only was it acutely in like a single session, but I'd have the same athletes, you know, six months, a year, and they weren't getting any better. They're getting better at the drills. They're getting really clean and crisp in the drills, but they weren't getting um, mechanically or technically better in an open environment. That would be back. That goes taking you back to agility, where this is linear sprinting, like a very repeatable, very kind of in a sense that's way more closed than actual agility in sport, right? And it's just super complex. There's a in kind of a in you know absorbent amount of uh, movement solutions that an athlete could have. And we're talking about sprinting, and I'm not seeing my athletes transfer in sprinting in a very repeatable linear type fashion. But how am I going to think these cone drills? I'm working on these 90 degree cut and 45 degree cut to recut, how am I thinking that those things are gonna transfer in a much more open, much more robust environment than linear sprinting? 
So that's kind of, that was kind of the mindset um, of dropping down um, much of those drills, not only for linear speed, but also for agility. That's why I kind of cut those out because I just wasn't seeing those things um, actually applying in the sport. It was just a waste of time. So going back to tr tr uh, transitional speed, yeah, if you, again, if you look at sport, and there's a couple of research papers done, I think it was done in soccer and actually rugby, as much as like 60% of, of sprints in sport are done from some sort of transition. You're either jogging, you're shuffling, you're, you're moving in some capacity, and you're kind of scanning the environment, you're searching the workspace, some, some information triggers you, and you have, then you have to transition to a sprint. Well, again, that's a different skill set than a stationary, yet most speed work is strictly stationary, right? You're in a two-point stance, or three-point stance, or we're gonna go. Or we're doing a flying 10, you're just gonna kind of start against, you're gonna start statically and then into a sprint. But sports, again, you're moving in some capacity, you're jogging, you're shuffling, and then you have to move to 100%. So you're not, you, you're not having that stationary or static start into a sprint, you actually have to transition from some sort of uh, previous movement. And that's a different skill set. And so we try to include a lot of different transitional movements, and that's where contextual sprinting, I think, takes care of all that like if you're putting your athletes in contextual environments there's going to be a ton of opportunities a ton of instances where they're going to have they're going to be doing some sort of movement a ball will release or an athlete will release or whatever it may be and they're, they're going to have to transition into acceleration or a sprint from that previous uh, locomotion so um, I think coaches need to get out of the mindset that we always have to train sprinting or speed or linear speed from a static position or static start it involves, it's a lot deeper than just statically starting into a sprint. Um, just watch sport. Watch some of the big plays in sport where athletes are just jogging or they have the ball and they're setting up a defender by just lulling them to sleep, going slow, and then, boom, you know, quickly sprinting by them. So um, I do a little bit in terms to address it, but I think when you build, when you start to think about building contextual environments that kind of represent or have snippets of sport, those transitional periods are going to be automatically in there because that's what sport is. That's the nature of sport. Yeah. Going back to, uh, you, you touched on it briefly a couple of times, but I want to talk about the warm up and how you uh, see it and structure it. Uh, maybe what would be interesting is can you give your, your take on how did you structure warm ups when you started coaching uh, a decade ago and how, what do your warm ups look like now? Yeah. So obviously a decade ago it was probably your traditional strength conditioning warm up. You know, you, you get kids in lines and they're going to do uh, world's greatest stretch, inchworms, knee hugs, you know, quad stretches, lateral lunges, et cetera, um, depending on the, the day. So if it's, let's say it's a linear speed day, then we're going to go um, A skips, B skips, C skips. We're going to do all the basic skipping drills, et cetera. Um, if it was a lateral day, you're going to do like just, a, you know, a shuffle, a crossover step, a backward 45, um, karaoke, those type of things. Um, so that was kind of the traditional, it was kind of what you probably see most people do. Now it is uh, much more of the whole warm up is kind of two things. Either one, if I have a specific uh, athletes from a specific sport, the warm up looks like sport. I want them to calibrate to the information. So if I go on my the field with my football players, like we don't do really any of that. Like we'll get in lines and do slow speed, like pat and go which is like a quarterback just throwing nice, easy fade routes to the receivers while the defender is working with the, with the receiver. So they're coupled to the receiver, doing like an easy back pedal, turning the hip. So the, it actually looks like sport, but just at slower speeds, lower intensities, um, smaller spaces, uh, kind of um, um, less complexity. So that's kind of what our warm-up looks like if I have a certain sport that I'm working with. It is about uh, calibrating them to the information uh, you know, uh, attuning them to the information much more than just simply we want to raise, you know, body temperature, get the CNS ready to go, prepare the tissues, et cetera. For my private sector here, when we have, you know, groups of 10, 12 athletes and they're from, you know, six to eight different sports, what I want them to do is kind of explore and exploit. That's kind of the two words that I like to use. So a lot of it is exploration. So they're going to explore the space. We do things like where they're crawl exploring, where they're like doing different animal movements on the ground. They're not repeating things. They're getting outside of their comfort zone. I'm not telling them what they have to do, but rather they're doing it themselves. They may be doing like different box parkour jumps or they're jumping over a box. And I might say, do whatever you want. Uh, that may be one rep. Next rep, put your left hand has to touch it. I don't care what you do or how you do it, but your left hand has to touch the box. Might be doing different tumbling uh, rolls, uh, things like that. Then the second category would be like, I want them to exploit. So this is where we're going to usually partner up or get in groups of three 
and they're going to be doing different um, low level, low intense movements like a shuffle, like a crossover step, um, like a backward 45, like a stop and go, but they're doing it with a partner. So one partner's offense, one partner's defense. And the offense now is manipulating the defense. They're trying to exploit them. They're trying to create space. They're trying to manipulate their speed and their tempo. They're trying to be deceptive. They're trying not to let the defender read them. The defender now is learning how, to, how and where do I place my eyes. I have to respond and react to the, to the offensive player. Can I start to attune or pick up? Can I pick up what um, information that they're do, using, that they're doing? Can I pick up on that so I can anticipate it or react faster? So, we're, so all that is them trying to exploit. Can I exploit a, a, position, a person? Can I exploit space? So that's kind of what our warm-up looks like now. So like I talked about earlier, like our warm-up probably looks like a lot of mirroring activities, a lot of cat-mouse activities, um, a lot of tag activities in terms of if we're in a group dynamic um, where they're working to exploit another person or point or space. Um, preceding that, like our opening or range of motion type stuff would be like them exploring the space. So crawls, tumbling, gymnastics, parkour type activities. Uh, again, where there's no necessarily directions or instructions, specific instructions that I have them that they have to, they have to accomplish. It's more about them um, trying to be creative, trying to be adaptable, trying to explore the space, um, that kind of thing. Again, with our sport athletes, it's more about calibrating to the information of the sport. It's going to look and feel like sport. Um, so different warm-ups for different groups of athletes in different ages. Yeah, I think that's an interesting approach. Plus, it gives that, that idea of you, you, you're right away into the thing. You're not like doing some, you know, quote unquote, boring stuff for 15 minutes. And then you actually get to the sport. Like you said, the closer we can get to the sport, whether it's in our warm-ups or in our, or in our physical prep, the better it's going to transfer and the better we'll do eventually um, or in the end on the field because we've just been doing more of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So all of my older athletes, I got one sitting here in front of me actually, but the, like they know that when we get our warm-up, we're usually getting into it and it's, you know, pretty quickly we're into it. And so my older athletes that maybe need a little bit more time because um, of wear and tear in their body, know to get here 20, 30 minutes early and take time doing some of those other things. But we're not going to, I'm not going to take my, our, 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 like you said, we don't have a lot of time. We're not going to take our time working on all of those different things of where they're going to foam roll or get us a lacrosse ball for 15 minutes. They're going to do their, their mobility type things. They know that, they, that that's on them. It's part of that, that piece that we worked on. We talked about earlier, the other 23 hours that, they want to get here 20, 30 minutes early before a session starts to get that stuff done because when they get here, they, they know it's time to go. And so um, my athlete, just he's an older guy. He's about 30, right? 30, he knows. He's like, I said 15 to 20 minutes. He's like 60. <laughs> so he, he's here an hour beforehand, getting the sauna, um, doing the voodoo bands, rolling out, doing all the things that he needs, not only physically but mentally prepare. But then when they know when it's our session starts, we're, we're going to get after it. We're ready to go. Um, so our athletes know that they have some ownership and autonomy on their end to get themselves ready to go. It's not, they get something that it's not my job as a coach to make sure all my athletes are, are emotionally, mentally, and, and physically 100% ready to go. I, they have to take some ownership in that process. And so that's kind of what we tell our athletes and they, and they understand that. So, um, that's kind of how we approach it in terms of older athletes, or if they need extra work, they know they have to come here early to get it done. Yeah, that's that's really cool how you essentially give responsibilities to the athletes to, you know, get get the work that they have to get done beforehand so that when it's time to hit it, you can just get the get get to work kind of thing. Uh, and that kind of rolls perfectly into the, the next bit, the other 23, like you like you call it. Um, so how do you broach those topics with? Uh, maybe youth athletes, college athletes who maybe don't want to hear about the, the nutrition piece and the sleep piece and, and, and the mobility and soft tissue work. How do you get into that with a population that's usually pretty uh, resistant to those ideas to begin with? Um, we just try. That's the only thing we can do is try. Um, and again, I'm sure half what I tell my athletes, my high school, middle school, even college athletes goes in one ear and out the other, but we try. I mean, Again, just about everyone, every day, we start with like a five-minute minute educational piece. So we'll talk about, we'll have them fill out uh, what they ate for that day, and we'll just talk about it, have a conversation about it, see if they can add more things, or, you know, why did you make that decision? You know, try to lead, try to peel back some of the layers of, what, you know, why did you have it for breakfast? Well, because I woke up 10 minutes late. Well, all right, the reason they had bad breakfast is because they woke up 10 minutes late. So let's, let's try to influence and affect that, that sleep behavior, because that will then snowball into having a better breakfast but we I, again 
I'm sure my athletes get sick of it, or I'm sure I, sometimes I look at their faces and there's a glaze over their face. But we start like every session with five, five to ten minutes of like educational, um, whether it be just me sitting on a bench and we're just talking, um, or I have PowerPoints. So we ask call it meeting mon meeting Mondays or talk Tuesdays. They come into our office. I'd have a you know a couple of slides and a PowerPoint. And we just talk about those things. Now, is it is it impacting them? I think some of them yes, some of them no, but. Um, that's part of the job as coaches that you just got to try and try to try to educate them and try to always just hammer away, hammer away, hammer away. Um, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, I'm probably pessimistic in that sense that I don't know if I'm, if it's really reaching a lot of athletes, but then you always have that, you know, one or two or, you know, small handful of athletes that come back and be like, you know, I worked, I, I did this, I had that super shake or I went to bed at, you know, 10 o'clock. I was consistent. I, I, I got, um, you know, a blackout windows for windows in my bedroom. There's, there's small athletes that come back and tell you those things that know, all right, at least I'm, at least I'm you know, uh, influencing or, or affecting a, a small handful of them. So that's all I can do is try. Again, I'm not, we don't have 100% success rates. Um, I'm sure our athletes get sick of me hearing it. Some athletes, it's like week after week, they're, they're not changing. Um, they're not, you know, but you never know when that thing will click. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing with youth athletes is that you never know when, you know, the right clicks or the, the light switches on in your head you know it's like you feel like you're talking to a brick wall you're not making any progress and then the athlete makes a huge a huge jump or huge change and they just buy in it, you never know when that happens or you don't think you're really influenced and affecting a kid and I've had this like a high school kid you're just like they don't they don't want to listen to what I say they don't they don't care and then you'll see them like three years later and they'll and they'll say you know you were really important those things that we talked about like those were really important to me at that time like I did not get that feeling from you at, at all at the time. So you just never know. Um, but again, you have to try. That's the only thing you do is, is try. And uh, um, so it, for us, it's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. Um, we talk daily, just about before every session. We have weekly goals. Like last week was to have a super sh shake or a super salad. Um, once a, one of those a day, one of those two a day. Um, you have, so I have athletes text me pictures of their super shake and super salad. Like this week, we'll have a different, we'll have a different goal. Um, so it's just trying, 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 just trying to keep hammering away at them, um, just wearing them down. And you never know when, when they might just finally like buy in and realize, you know, how important this stuff is. When it comes to mobility, soft tissue work, uh, that type of thing, kind of the, the flip, the flip of the coin of the training that you do in the gym uh, to kind of get back down to baseline, take care of your body, all those things. Do you have a certain number of modalities that you recommend or are you pretty open and kind of give them the lay of the land and then let them choose what, what fits them, whether it's, it's yoga, whether it's form rolling, whether it's massages, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, we, we give them some uh, things that we would like them to do, but we give them a lot of responsibility and autonomy in that regard. Um, again, that's, I think it's huge for athletes to have some of that autonomy and ownership because for one athlete that might, really down regulate from freaking massage and i have another athlete that really has a bad uh connotation or that just thinks massages are, are are i don't know how to put it but soft he doesn't like massages i don't mean, like it's it's he's a really strange kid really really good athlete but he thinks like for him like uh, you know someone that if him here like a, an opponent getting a massage like that kid's soft i i got that <laughs> message you you know so you you have to have they have to have that some autonomy in that regard but for me, when I try to influence, or in fact, kind of this goes back to the weight room, uh, you know, tissue resiliency or mobility, I'm a big fan of like loaded range of motion. So whether it be long duration ISO holds or like, you know, RDLs for like, if we want to lengthen out hamstrings, like RDLs is much better than some passive hamstring strength. If we want to think about, you know, uh, influencing a change in the quads, I'm much a big fan of like quad lowers or, or uh, sissy squats, something like that, much more than like just a, a quad stretch. And so we try to tell them that, you know, we give them some things they can be doing at home. Um, once they, again, this advanced athlete in front of me, he, you know, he knows that he, they have the freedom to pick whatever modalities that they think works for them best. Um, so they have some of that, that um, ownership um, and responsibility that they, they know they can choose those things. And that's a huge thing for athletes. And there's a lot of actually science and literature on that. When athletes have the ability to choose, they have the freedom of choice. There's much more buy-in, and they, they uh, there's much more benefit from them rather than me, the coach, telling them, "Well, you need to get a massage," even though the kid might like, "I'm not going to get a massage because that's I, I have bad connotations with that." So, um, giving our athletes choice is another huge thing, um, like you touched upon. I want to move on to uh, focus a little bit on you as a coach. 
Uh, can you talk about your, your coaching influences? Who do you or did you look up to uh, in the field uh, coming up? And, uh, and who do you still uh, look at today for inspiration and, and maybe guidance as to where to take your, your, your philosophy next? Yeah, well, the coaches that uh, I'll kind of lay out the first three would be coaches no one's ever heard of. Uh, but like I said, my dad was a, a football coach, still rock and rolling at almost 70 years old. Um, obviously, he was my first experience to a coach. Um, he's a very energetic um, coach, um, does a lot for his players, still rocking at close to 70 years old. Like I said, just, you know, his, his was he was going to outwork everybody. He, he, was, he was a grinder, and I know that's obviously – a little bit different than probably my viewpoint, but he was a definitely a grinder. My high school track coach, um, Mark Moss, again, someone no one's ever heard of, but um, one of the most like caring and genuine coaches I've ever had that just genuinely cared about you, A, as the, the person first, and then all your successes. It could be like a one inch PR in, in the long jump or, you know, one hundredth of a second, but the, for him, that, that was like the world. Like he made it celebrate like the world and he made you really feel good about yourself he made you and, and track and field um is kind of a boring i love i love track but it's kind of you know a boring sport um and he made it fun he made it engaging um he had a, he was passionate about it and you could just see that passion so uh, mark moss and my high school basketball coach hugh Ganatic, um he actually it's funny because hugh my coach hugh Ganatic, he's the all-time leading scorer in our high school and i'm second he always wanted me to beat his record so he's very he was very humble. He wanted people to succeed. And he put us in situations to be successful. And he always gave us confidence. And I'd have nights where I was struggling on the court. And he would just – and I'm like, he wouldn't take me out. He would sit me down on timeouts and just say, keep shooting. Just always admitted confidence to you. And always, you know, um, kind of gave us – gave me and the rest of our team freedom to do things. And, you know, we weren't afraid to make mistakes. We understood that making mistakes was part of the process. And he encouraged us to make mistakes. And he, he allowed us to make mistakes rather than making a mistake mistake and right away you're pulled out of the game which a lot of coaches do so then you become fearful of making mistakes you become fearful of trying new things you become feel fearful of being creative um so those are probably the three my three biggest influences um i don't really have a ton of influences in the world of strength and conditioning to be honest with you um close friends of mine sean mishka is a really dear friend um he's a guy that bounced a lot of ideas ideas off of we're part of a he helped co kind of co-found uh, with tyler yearby uh, emergence, which I'm part of, uh, kind of a, a member of that uh, company, which is a movement skill education company and consultation company that kind of what we talk about agility. That's what we work on um, of different products and consultations with, with teams. Um, been really successful here. We've been open for about a year, but Sean's a guy that I've looked up for, to for many years and always given me a ton of time. I'll start with one question and all of a sudden we have a three hour conversation. So he's always been, been really willing and generous with his time. Um, but outside of that, I don't have a ton of coaches in the uh in this that are well known in the strength conditioning, conditioning field that i really look up to or um look to for ideas and whatnot i don't know i've been pretty pretty blessed to have locally coaches that you know i've been able to bounce things off of um so that's kind of what i stick to yeah car carving your own path i like that um can you talk about the game book that you put out uh what is it what it is who it's for because it's a it's a lot of what you do and, and how you coach your especially the younger athletes even the older ones i mean it, it's all framed into games and we always say oh you need to make it fun you need to make the kids want to do it and not like force them so so where did that game book come from and and, and what, what does it do yeah so the, the game book i've gotten a lot of questions over the years of different games and activities that we do with our athletes and i finally during the quarantine was like yeah shit i got two months here let me just categorize, you know, uh, are these in different areas and put it together and uh, put it out there. So, you know, again, for me, again, our, my main population is that high school, middle school, adolescent, novice type athlete where the huge vast majority of them aren't going to go on to play college. And, you know, you know we might have count in one hand how many of those kids will then go play professionally. Even so, the, the goal, I think, of working with young athletes isn't for isn't elite performance it isn't high performance it isn't to put them in college it isn't isn't to give them a college scholarship etc it's them to really enjoy and embrace movement and embrace um the physical literacy uh, of what their bodies can do and so for me games are, are really important in that because they promote an environment of what we talked about they promote an environment of play of creativity of ownership of autonomy of adaptability and those are all skills those are all behaviors that i think transfer to all sports um and so for me i think we we oftentimes get caught up in the physical things right 
well, you got to get stronger because when you're stronger in the weight room, we're going to be stronger in the field and a stronger athlete is a better athlete. Well, behaviors also transfer. If I promote an environment that has ownership and um, has responsibility and allows creativity and allows athletes to make mistakes and allows them to kind of express, express themselves, I think those behaviors show up in sport. That's what I want. We all want our athletes to have ownership and responsibility. We don't want our athletes in the field looking over to the sidelines or the coach, like, what do I do next? Like, that's, that'd be the last thing that I want. So games are just one avenue or one vehicle to, to promote all of those qualities um, and, you know, promote our athletes to be creative, be adaptable, and, and have, um, have fun in that process because uh, I think that, to me, is really, really important. And it's really sad. Again, when I, you know, see young athletes come into our facility and building um, that are, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, and they, they lack those things. The kids intuitively and naturally are very um, creative. They're, they're, they like to explore. And when those things are killed because I, I see a kid come in and they, they played baseball their whole lives, and, they, and every, every second of their practice has been structured, and their, their mom or dad has been, you know, telling them what to do their whole lives, and they come in and they come in to me and they're like, I'll let you do what you want. What do you want to do here? And they're like, I don't know. But that's just sad. I think a lot of kids are being robbed of their childhood by overbearing parents and coaches that think that what they're doing is developing elite performance. And in my mind, I think it's robbing them of elite performance. It's giving them, it's giving them a high performance at 10, 11, 12 years old, but it's robbing them of the qualities. If you look at all high performers, think about high performers. All high performers are very creative. They, they, have, their, they have autonomy, they have ownership, they have their own personal style. They're not robots. They, they're great decision makers. Um, and I think we're robbing young kids of that if we're over-organizing and structuring everything that we do with our young athletes. And so for me, it's a lot about uh, just having them uh, the freedom to explore, create, make mistakes, because those things that I think give them the power and the encouragement to when they get to their sport to continue to, to, do, to do those things. And so, again, if I look at every high performer I've ever worked with, is they, they have those qualities and they, they are not robbed of those qualities. Um, and so that's what I try to provide with that game book and with our youth athletes, just an environment for them to explore, create, um, have fun. Because again, if a kid isn't having fun, they're not going to play a sport. If a kid isn't having fun, they're, they're missing out not only on the sports, but the, the, the benefits of physical literacy, of movement, of all the unique and incredible things that a human body is able to do. And that's why you, you see, you know, 25 or 35 year olds that, are lazy or not lazy, but they're um, sedentary. They don't move. They don't under their bodies in uh, pain because they don't get out of the structured movement and explore all the unique ways that the body's capable of moving. Michael, it's been absolute pleasure talking to you tonight. Uh, can you tell people where they can find you on the internet if they're interested in learning more about what you do? Yeah, certainly. Um, I, on social media, I believe we're uh, BBA Performance, so uh, at BBA Performance on Instagram, and the website is building-better-athlete.com. Um, but yeah, that's about it, yeah. Awesome, man. It was a great pleasure, and I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it.